welcome Holly Lockwood Smith, who's going to do her speech on fixity and fluidity in sexual orientation. Um, to read her bio, um, Holly Lockwood Smith is an associate professor in political philosophy at the University of Melbourne. Her new book, Sex Matters, came out with Oxford University Press in July. And her last book, Gender Critical Feminism, came out with the same publisher in May last year. Holly has spoken at previous IWD Mianjin Brisbane events and conferences, and we warmly welcome her back. Okay, so um, in a discussion with Diana Fleischman for the Aporia podcast in May about how to free sexually conservative women from the expectation that they engage in casual sex with men, Diana suggested that we encourage women to masturbate more, and Louise counter-suggested tactical lesbianism. <laughs> now I have to say, they were joking around, uh, and it was just a brief moment, so we shouldn't necessarily take this to be a considered view that either one of them is advocating. But I had a reaction to it. Um, when I heard it, because of course if you are a lesbian, it's not necessarily an appealing idea uh, to think that some of the women you might end up dating are just uh, filling in their time with you so as not to suffer any lack of sexual intimacy uh, while they play the game of hooking a high quality man. Um, and it's a bit uncomfortable to think that feminists would be encouraging them to do this. Perhaps there's also a male type assumption about the good of sex and the meaning of sex here. Um, that lesbians would be glad to have a bigger pool of people to have sex with, uh, even if many of those people were just tourists. So this is a different issue to the political lesbianism issue because of the tactical part. Whereas political lesbianism is intended as a permanent choice, tactical lesbianism is intentionally temporary. Now I'm telling you about this as a framing, slightly throwing Louise under the bus, but then taking it back. Uh, because I think that in light of the empirical work I'm about to tell you more about, my reaction was probably understandable but ultimately unjustified. So if women's sexuality works in the way that at least one contemporary sexuality researcher thinks that it does, then tactical lesbianism may just be a fast track uh, to women discovering same-sex desire, attraction and satisfaction that they always had a capacity for. Now, one of the familiar projects, of course, of feminism has been to try to correct for androcentrism, male-centeredness, uh, and any of a huge number of areas. And this is uh, the feminist psychologist Carol Gilligan, who I'm sure a lot of you recognize. Uh, she talked about how male psychologists had built theories of human psychology out of studying men. Uh, and she said, can you really leave out women and miss nothing of significance? The feminist uh, philosopher of science, Helen Longino, uh, advocates the bottom line for feminist research and science being to make gender a relevant axis of investigation. So we can take this approach to women's sexuality and ask what has been missed uh, in thinking about the nature of women's sexuality by taking men's sexuality as the standard and generalizing from it. And the model that we have from generalizing from men is that sexual orientation is fixed from an early age, will not change across a lifetime, and is driven by something intrinsic to men, like maleness or like testosterone. Now, interestingly enough, apparently studies on the biological causes of sexual orientation actually started out being more equally about both sexes, but then became more focused on men, and I quote her, because the findings for men were so much more consistent and promising than the findings for both sexes considered together. And I'm about to tell you a bit about some of that inconsistency now. So just to give you a sense of the sex-distinguished sexual orientation distribution, consider the graph on the right uh, from Michael Bailey and colleagues based on a sample of 4,901 Australian twins. They use the Kinsey scale, which again I'm sure is familiar, but in case anyone hasn't seen it, there's a representation there. Ignore the rainbow, it's absolutely useless, it's just making it pretty. That's just about the scale from zero to six. So they used this scale, zero and six, as exclusively uh, opposite or same-sex attracted, and then one to five as increasing degrees of same-sex attractiveness along the way. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Could you read those uh, markers more slowly? So 
So you basically just have polarized exclusive attractions, yes. either opposite sex or same sex. Yes. So heteros are zeros, lesbians and gay men are six, sixes, yes. and then increasing from one through five your degree of attraction to the oh. same sex. So it's trying to make a spectrum of strict, uh, strict categories. So in the Bailey and colleagues study, um, they were focusing on psychological sexuality rather than sexual behavior. So that means they're interested in proportion of sexual fantasies, desires, and attractions. So this graph that you can see extracts from their total participant pool the 147 men and 238 women who had non-zero Kinsey scores. So rule out all the heteros and then go from your one through your sixes to the little bit bisexual, a little bit more, a little bit more, and then, and then your lesbians. Or what we would call, let's see where we get to by the end of the talk. Um, okay, so as you can see, there's much more polarization for men. Men are the black um, bars in the graph. So it's much more um, polarized between the exclusive ends and then you get your sharp sort of U-shaped curve. Um, whereas for the women, as you can see, there's a sort of downward, sharp downward drop from heterosexuality onwards and then just like the briefest possible recovery at the end between the fives and the sixes. <laughs> so um, Bailey and his colleagues were interested in the genetic basis for sexual orientation, so they were comparing in this study monozygotic, so identical twins, to dizygotic or non-identical twins. And they found that male identical twins were much more likely to have the same sexual orientations than male non-identical twins, but this was not true for female twins. Mm, and true. in general, it was only 20 to 24 percent of those individuals for whom sexual orientation at all was thought to have a genetic explanation. So there's a lot of variance to be accounted for even if you give some role to the genetic uh, explanation. So their conclusion was that male and female sexual, sexual orientation should be analysed separately and probably require different theoretical accounts. Yes, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> so here is where Lisa Diamond comes in. Uh, she's a feminist psychologist and she decided to take up that challenge, uh, studying female sexual orientation separately and offering a distinct uh, hypothesis as to its explanation. And she summarizes her work, some of which is published in previous papers, in this 2008 book, Sexual Fluidity. So remember I said earlier that sexual, sexuality researchers narrowed their focus to men because their findings were more consistent and promising? So now I'm going to tell you a bit more about the inconsistency that Diamond found before we then get on to her proposed explanation. And I'm sure her explanation is going to piss some people off, so I'm looking forward to talking more about this uh, later in the day. So she's done a long-term research study on sexual minority women, aged between 16 and 23 at the time of recruitment. She had a pool of 89 participants. Uh, at the start of the study, 43% were lesbians. 43% <laughs> said they were lesbians, 30% uh, said they were bisexuals, and 27% didn't claim any particular identity label. They just considered themselves non-heterosexual. Average age at the first interview was 20, the study ran for 10 years, and she interviewed these women once every two years. First round of interviews, 1995, last round, 2005, and then the reporting is coming out in this book three years later, in 2008. And by 2005, there's 79 participants left, and that's normal in a long-term study that you get some drop-off. So she, she discovers at the first interview that sexual identity labels had already changed over time for many of the participants. So she writes, already at the first interview, about one half of the lesbian women reported initially coming out as bisexual, and about one third of the bisexual women reported initially coming out as lesbian. And this was already surprising to her because previous explanations of change in identity labels had supposed that the labels were transitional, while people were still figuring things out in a highly stigmatized environment. So she thought with greater knowledge and less stigma, there should not be such a process. People should just figure out who they are and then tell people who they are. But there did still seem to be this change going on. Um, so let's wait one second. So at the second interview, a further one third of the participants had changed identity labels again. So this is two years later. 
And most of these went from unlabeled to either lesbian or bisexual labels, but some went from lesbian or bisexual to unlabeled. Again, in her words, she says, the most unexpected finding was that five women actually gave up their lesbian or bisexual labels in favor of unlabeled identities, and an additional five women started calling themselves heterosexual. Yet every single one of them continued to acknowledge attractions to women. The women who started calling themselves heterosexual typically reported that their same-sex attractions simply were not strong or frequent enough to justify identifying as lesbian or bisexual. They were generally more interested in men and expected to end up with men down the line. So again, as she notes, this is kind of unexpected because the standard assumption that identity labels are transitional predicts that any change would move people toward lesbianism. So a same-sex attracted woman might initially refuse any label and then maybe she says she's bisexual, and then she eventually lands on uh, lesbian, but she wouldn't be moving back the other way toward heterosexual. And this fact of change <laughs> did not stop each two years of the study. It just carried on like that. So between the second and third interviews, another 25% of the participants changed their sexual identity labels. I don't know if this is on the slide. Yes. Three lesbians switched to bisexual, one bisexual and one unlabeled woman switched to lesbian, three lesbian and three bisexual women switched to unlabeled, six bisexuals now identified as heterosexual, and three of the women who had adopted heterosexual labels at the previous interview changed their minds and now considered themselves non-heterosexual but unlabeled. <laughs> final two interviews, the fourth and the fifth, were much the same. So roughly a third uh, uh, changed identities between the third and fourth interviews, and another third changed between the fourth and fifth. So over the total 10-year period of the interviews, two-thirds of the participants had changed their sexual identity labels at least once, and some had changed it multiple times. Diamond says the woman who kept the same identity for the whole 10 years proved to be the smallest and most atypical group. Okay, now of course sexual orientation could remain completely unchanged underneath, uh, while sexual identity labels fluctuate wildly on top of it. That could be a thing. So perhaps women's actual attractions are stable, but what they call themselves isn't, and we can find some explanation of the latter. And then that would not show sexual fluidity, it would only show self-concept fluidity, uh, which is, at least to my mind, a lot less interesting. But this wasn't true. Attractions didn't vary wildly, so the maximum variation in the proportion of same-sex versus opposite-sex attractions between the two yearly interviews was about 20%, which is not a lot. Um, so it seems like orientations measured by attraction were relatively stable, but identities did seem to be changing. So the question is why? Now she looked at the ratio of same-sex versus other sex relationships women in the study had engaged in since the last interview, as well as whether they were in a relationship at the time of the interview and with which sex. And this was more explanatory. So she says, um, Women who were currently involved with a man were more likely than those currently involved with women and those unattached to report changing their identity since the preceding interview. And similarly, those who had had a greater proportion of their sexual and romantic relationships with men since the last interview were more likely to have changed identities. So it appeared that identity change was accommodating men. Um, she writes, of all the identity changes undertaken uh, over the course of the study, more than 80% accommodated attractions to and relationships with men. So that is lesbians, in quote marks, switching to bisexual or unlabeled, or bisexual switching to unlabeled, that was two-thirds of all the changes, uh, or it's any of those groups switching to heterosexual, which happened in 16% of the changes. So it's not identity alone changing with orientation remaining fixed, it's sexual experience or behavior changing, uh, and then identity changing in order to accommodate it. Now she is clear to say that this does not mean that lesbians, not in quote marks, <laughs> were changing their identity labels. 
She says it became increasingly clear to her that uh, the total participant pool could be divided into two groups. Um, first, lesbians who had been exclusively attracted to and involved with women throughout the study and who were least likely to change their identities. And second, uh, everyone else. And she, introdu she introduces the term non-exclusivity for that group of women, all of the what would have previously been called bisexuals on the Kinsey 1 through 5. At this point, uh, you might be wondering if, if this is all really about bisexuals, so now we call them non-exclusives, but that's the same group of people, why are we talking about them at a conference about lesbians? Um, and my answer is that it affects us. So in Diamond's view, as I understand her, there is a poor public understanding of how women's sexuality works, including among women ourselves. And that leads to many women misunderstanding themselves and mislabeling themselves. And that can then lead to situations in which they are misleading potential and actual partners, and it closes off possibilities for intimacy and joy. So it's both a matter of which heterosexuals are actually bisexuals or lesbians, which is something that the political lesbians have been interested in talking about, but and it's also a matter of which lesbians are actually bisexuals or heterosexuals, and that's something that is less countenanced, although I think it might be coming to be discussed more with the rise in the LGBTQ labeling, uh, which is seen as something countercultural and more about identity than being about information that expresses your actual sexual behavior or practice. Okay, so I'll finish by just briefly explaining how Diamond hypothesizes that women's sexuality in particular works. So that requires three key ideas. The first is proceptivity versus arousability. We'll explain what she means by that soon. Second, the unorientation of romantic love. And then the third, the connection between romantic love and sexual desire. So, proceptivity is something like lust or libido or horniness, and it tends to be driven by hormones. So, in men, it's driven by testosterone and it's relatively stable, it's just at whatever level that it's at across their lives. And in women, it fluctuates across the month, tracking her um, ovulation. Arousability is supposed to be much more context specific, triggered by sexual cues, so meaning things like uh, smells, images, ideas, particular environments, and so on. So Diamond proposes that we think of our ordinary understanding of sexual orientation as tracking proceptivity alone, baseline levels of lust or libido, but keeping arousability in context-specific ways separate. Then the thought is that because women's proceptivity fluctuates across her cycle, she will have less generalized lust or libido in comparison to men, but she will have greater opportunity for situation-specific arousability. If only proceptivity is oriented towards same-sex, opposite-sex, or both, but arousability isn't, then we already would have an explanation for sex difference in same-sex attractions. The idea behind the second bullet point is that the emotions involved in romantic love have as their ultimate evolutionary explanation infant caregiver attachment not adult pair bonding. So they are then unoriented by sex because it would have been maladaptive for an infant to be selective about the sex of which caregiver, the sex of its caregiver. So the thought is if that's the ultimate evolutionary explanation, then you can fall in love with anyone. Those emotions can occur um, with anyone. And then the third idea is that there are psychological, cultural, and neurobiological links between romantic love and sexual desire in both directions, even though they're underwritten by distinct mechanisms. So people generally accept that sexual desire and connection can lead to love over time. It builds a kind of closeness and bonding and people fall in love, but she is saying it also runs the other way. So you can fall in love, and particularly she proposes this like by the root of the release of oxytocin, you can then get sexual desire out of love. So the causal pathway runs both ways. So if love is unoriented, you're a lesbian, you fall in love with a man, sexual desire can follow the chemicals that are released by love, lo and behold you have this unique and exceptional experience that completely freaks you out because you thought you were a lesbian. And you tell that story for any sexuality in any direction. 
Okay, so we put these three ideas together to get a story about the, to get a theory about the sexual fluidity um, being more characteristic of women's sexuality and possibly explanatory of all those changes in sexual identity labeling uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, the question we're left with is what should we do with the concept of sexual orientation and the labels lesbian and bisexual? Diamond thinks we should give more attention to the different combinations of proceptivity and arousability in women, but she doesn't comment on whether we should adapt sexual identity labels to sexual orientation and fluidity. So given the unpredictability of where fluidity might take each woman, adapting the labels might have the rather radical consequence that all women should simply go unlabeled, because how could she possibly know what the future holds? But if we reserve the term lesbian for proceptivity alone and we got better at figuring out which attractions were caused by proceptivity and which by arousability, then we might be able to countenance currently peculiar seeming arrangements like a lesbian falling in love with and marrying a man and that not being inconsistent with her being a lesbian. Or alternatively, of course, we might want to reserve the term lesbian for exclusively same-sex proceptivity and arousability but then we're still stuck with what to say about sexual desire that's caused by unoriented love. So we still have a problem. <laughs> <laughs>